We welcome you back into the Tell Me Shorts today. Yesterday we were talking about God's way or our way. Today I want to change it up a little bit and talk about the effectiveness of God's way. The effectiveness, effectiveness of God's way. What is it? How does things work out when we do it God's way? That's what I want to talk to you about today. Again, we go back to the Old Testament, to a long portion of Scripture, so that we can draw out the principles of how they were applied then and how they are applicable to us today. Why? Because the Word of God is eternal. It's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It's eternal. So I want to draw your attention to the effectiveness of God's way. Let me ask you to read with me into Exodus chapter 3. And what we're going to do is go to Exodus chapter 3, look at verses 1 through 22. 1 through 22. The subtleties of these principles are found inside of these scriptures. When you slow down your reading, you and I need to slow down in our reading of the Word of God and let the Word permeate our minds and our hearts. Let's read together. Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, the why the bush is not burned up. And so when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Then he said, Do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing, flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the, Hez and the Hittite and the Amorite and the, per and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cries of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have been the I have seen the oppression with which, an Egy, which which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now, and I will send to you the I will send you to the Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? Who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh, and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly. I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, What? He says, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. Go, go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me, saying, I am indeed, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Parasites and the Hivites and the Jebusites to the land flowing with milk and honey. They will pay heed to what you say. And you with the elders of Israel will come to the king of Egypt and you will say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrew, has met with us. And so now, please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know, 
I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. I will grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be, and it shall be that when you go, you will not go empty handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and your daughters. Thus you will plunder the Egyptians. Now, there's a lot in here to unpack. You need to understand. It. There's just an incredible amount of information here. But in it are all these subtleties of what God tells him to do. And Moses did exactly how he told him to do it. And yesterday, you remember, we had, we had observed how ineffective Moses' self-reliant self actions were. You remember that? We talked about that? Today, we'll see, we're going to see how God can do in the life of someone who is fully committed and submitted to him. Now, if we let Moses, and I want you to know this, if we let Moses' example teach us about the dangers of self-sufficiency and the advantages of depending on the Lord, we'll save ourselves a lot of hardship. We're just going to say an untold amount of hardship we're going to be saved by. Listen, when we submit to God, when we submit to God's way, he'll do amazing things through our life that you never just expect. You see, you know, you know one of our problems is that I just... What's God going to do through me? I mean, who am I? What are you going to do through me? Think about that. But when you submit to him, it's an amazing thing to see how God uses and works through your life. And this is exactly what we see in the life of Moses, especially someone who had already failed. Look, despite the past failures, set that aside. Okay? Just Moses was still used in accomplishing the divine plan. Just because you messed up and you failed once, twice, thrice, four times, five times. Let me tell you something. God can still use you. Now, nobody else may think that, but I don't care about anybody else. God can still use you. Listen, but only after, after Moses became usable, if I can use that word. After Moses became usable, that is, humbled, and broken of his self-will, okay? Just consider what God achieved when Moses just, just simply relinquished control into the hands of God. He didn't argue with God. He asked him one question, but he didn't argue with God, and he did exactly as God told him what to do. Now look at the things that God accomplished when Moses submitted himself completely to God's control the same way you and I submit ourselves to the complete control of God. First thing, number one, he showed he could do great things through a yielded person. A yielded person. See, that's our challenge. God showed that he could do things through a yielded person. Moses be yielded to him. Are you yielded? Or you still got the I am, the great I am, and I'm going to do it my way. Think about that for a moment. Secondly, do you realize that God, he got more done in less time with fewer resources? There was no instruction, okay? I mean, think about that. There was no insurrection. There was, there was no insurrection among the Hebrews. There was nothing. There was no rebellion, nothing that. There was no insurrection or lengthy war took place. Just a dramatic display of God's power. He got more done in less time with less resources when Moses did it his way. Third, he proved the superiority of his way by freeing over two million people without the loss of one single Hebrew life. Not one Hebrew died in all this. That's what's absolutely amazing. Fourth, he sent the slaves out of bondage with their captors' riches. I mean, they were dirt slave poor. 
and they walked out with all of Egypt's riches. Look, let me show you. Go to your book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 3. And I want you to look at verse 21 and 22. Exodus chapter 3, verse 22. This is where we were reading, okay? Go back, look at verse 21, 22. He says, I will grant this people, this is God speaking to Moses. I will grant this people, the Hebrews, favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be that when you go, you will not go empty-handed. Look at verse 22. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and your daughters. Thus you will plunder the Egyptians. Here's the fifth thing that happened. He proved to both the Israelites and the Egyptians that he alone is God, is the God of heaven and earth. Sixth. Hmm? He received all the glory. All of the glory. I want you to think about this woman. And this is a key concept that I want to see if I can communicate with you. Our past failures never, present, never prevent God's willingness or ability to use us. Even though I have failed in the past, it doesn't prevent Him, okay, to use us, or His willingness or His ability to use us. Just because you have messed up one time, twice, and multiple times does not mean that God cannot use you. Nobody else may believe that, but I don't care about anybody else. But God does. In fact, do you realize that in our weaknesses, okay, is a great opportunity for him to display his power in our lives. In our own strength, we are totally ineffective. Just ask Moses. In our own strength, we are totally ineffective. But when we submit to the Lord's authority in our life, we can experience his victory in whatever he calls us to do.